You can see our lovely panelists here on the screen in front of you, so we're, we're going to get started in just a moment. So uh, again, everybody, welcome. Really happy to have you here with us. My name is Bonnie Bright. I'm the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance and also the executive editor of Depth Insights Journal, which has been in publication for six, almost six years now, and that comes out twice a year. And this year, for this particular publication, we have started uh, Depth Insights Press as a an, what's called an imprint, so it's basically able to publish books and, and that will be our desire moving forward to use that to continue to publish these kinds of anthologies that are filled with contributions from people who are interested in depth psychology and union psychology. So really happy to have you all here. I see that we've lost Robert. He's going to come back, I promise. <laughs> we'll make sure that it happens. But in the meantime, I just wanted to once again encourage you to use the chat function if you'd like to during, throughout the course of this webinar. And as you go about doing that, you know, I, I just would really love to tell you to keep in mind that we are digitally connected and it's not something that's going to go away obviously anytime soon. And I personally am just so grateful for technology and the opportunities that it provides us. And of course, as most of you who have read at least the introduction to depth psychology in the digital age will notice there are multiple ways to look at how depth, how di the digital age affects us all. So I'd like to just read you a couple of excerpts from that particular introduction in order to get us started here, and then I will introduce the panelists and let them share a bit each about the articles that they have contributed to this, to this anthology. And by the way, if you are interested and able to join us, we will be doing another one of these panels this coming Saturday, December 3rd at noon Pacific Standard Time. So please come back for that. We'll have three or four, actually four other different panelists. And and we'll also be recording that if you can't make it but you're interested, but it's always great to have people attending live because we have that interaction and that interconnectivity. So uh, as most of you know, there, there's a lot of controversy about the digital age. Technology has been vilified by a number of people and obviously it's been praised and really even lauded. It's been so heavily adopted that we can't imagine our lives without technology at this point in time. And We've heard of, of some of these disorders that are stemming from the whole technology thing, like cyberchondriacs, which are, is a term that is now used for people who go and diagnose their symptoms online for medical symptoms. And I, I've been guilty of doing that many times. I'm sure that most of you have too. There's also something called Facebook addiction disorder. <laughs> I suspect a lot of you that are listening to this can also relate to that and understand, kind of goes without saying, obviously, what that is. But, but you know, um, <laughs> there's a lot, there's also a lot of good things that can come from that. And some people, particularly on the Jungian side of things, uh, coming from the psychology of C.G. Jung, who was born actually in 1875 and died in 1960 or 61, 61, I think. He, uh, he obviously didn't know anything about the digital age, but he expressed a lot of concerns about modernity and how modernity was affecting us. And part of it was just really interfering with our capacity to be reflective. And so as those of you who have, re who have read the article that I contributed to this, I talk about something that's called the great acceleration, which is a term that's been identified by some social scientists who refer to the fact that our population on the planet has tripled since we began, uh, well, really, since we began focusing on consumerism in a, in a large part, and so part of my article is about that as well, and, and it's also in large part about e-waste, and that with that tripling of the population, we've also increased exponentially our need for cables to connect us all, for transportation, for communication, and so all of these wires have had to go in. Everything has just intensified really rapidly, and and has grown really rapidly. And I know that a lot of you are probably feeling, as I often do too, just the overwhelm that comes from moving at a particular pace. And so where does that, you know, where do we begin to sort of get a foot in the door to start to find, again, some balance and, and to really start to tease out what it is about, about technology, really, that can be productive and generative and not just difficult and causing us additional problems. So there's a woman by the name of Dolores E. Bryan, who is a Jungian analyst, and she's written about technology from a depth psychological perspective for many decades now. And she talks about the internet uh, as being an extraordinary locus, L-O-C-U-S, so a, a focal point, really, a, a generative point. She says, the internet is an ex extraordinary locus for fathoming the depths of the collective unconscious of our time. 
It can be as fertile a psychological field as fairy tales, folklore, and ancient myths have been. On the internet, new myths are being formed, hitherto ignored archetypes are coming into their own, and new adventures for the psyche await us. So I like to look at it from that standpoint, all the while being very aware that there is obvious, there are obviously a lot of challenges that are associated with it. This, this book contains a wide variety of articles on, on a wide variety of topics, everything from video games to the internet to a little bit of artificial intelligence and, and many other topics, almost every topic that you can imagine in technology. And we probably will cover some of all of those today, I'm hoping. But without further ado, I'd like to really turn the time over to our panelists so that they have plenty of time to talk about their contributions. And, and hopefully we'll still have a little bit of time at the end for some discussion, some Q&A. And as I mentioned, you're welcome to type in questions if you have them, and we can either take them kind of individually as we go, or maybe we'll save them to the end, depending on what happens. So, and I also see that Robert didn't make it back, so I might have to disappear for a minute and see if I can go help him come back to the meeting. He's done this many times and I suspect that his problem might be internet. So, But without further ado, let me share a little, let me introduce our first panelist and I think that you'll be fascinated by what he's saying. I was mentioning to him before we started today that his article is really one of my favorites in the book. It's called Madness and the Map. And so we'll be hearing first from Drew Foley, PhD. And let me just share Drew's bio with you so that everybody has some background on him. And then, and then Drew, I will turn the floor over to you. So Drew Thomas Foley, PhD, is an educator, researcher, and entrepreneur. His interest in depth psychology and the digital aid traces back to his undergraduate studies in psychology at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon. For the last 25 years, he has lived and worked in Southern California, where he earned a Master's of Business Administration from Pepperdine University and a Master's of Arts in Human Development from Fielding Graduate University. In 2012, Drew earned his PhD in Human and Organizational Systems from Fielding and his dissertation, Navigating Mythic Space in the Digital Age, focuses on how digital technology shapes the ways that we live, work, and learn. He continues his research as a fellow for the Institute of Social Innovation and teaches courses in organizational development and technology management. So Drew, thank you so much for being with us today and spending some time. The floor is now yours. All right, thanks Bonnie. And I hope Robert makes it back. One of my rules in life is that it's always fair to blame technology. <laughs> Sounds uh, so, good. Uh, so with that, um, I thank Bonnie also for bringing the book together. It, proves that all things are possible with patient <laughs> persistence. It does. Uh, so I just wanted to share a little bit first about the digital age, then about maps, and then about madness. And so that's what I'll use my couple of minutes here for. So the digital age is something we all inhabit the digital age, but it also inhabits us. It inhabits the way that we see the world and the way that we think about the world. And that first became, um, became um, aware of that when I was in high school and I programmed computer video games for the uh, VIC-20 and the Commodore 64 and the Atari 400 and the Atari 800. So I wrote a video game uh, for the VIC-20, which was a computer that had uh, 65K uh, of memory, uh, which my computer that I'm talking on to you today has about a million times as much memory as that computer. And so every character that was created on the screen used up space and memory. So I wrote a video game called Ruse on Fire, which was like Donkey Kong. It was kind of a, a either a ripoff of Donkey Kong or a tribute to Donkey Kong, depending upon your perspective. And what I realized uh, about the digital age was that when I played the game and uh, published the game, I had a bug that was first reported to me in which someone playing the game reported that when they used the joystick and held it all the way to the right uh, at the bottom of the screen, eventually the head of the kangaroo would disappear and then you could play the game with a headless kangaroo. And so what was happening in that computer program was that the joystick was running through the memory of the computer and eventually overwrote the part of memory where the kangaroo's head was stored. And so what I learned from that is digital information is different than analog information. So when you turn a one into a zero or a zero into a one, it causes an effect that you may not be able to imagine or foresee. My second story is about maps. And in the year 2000, I got the job of 
convincing auditors around the world that the world was not going to come to a halt on January 1st, 2000, that we would still be able to continue processing information. So I traveled around the world and flew from airport to airport. And one of my trips took me to Newark, New Jersey. I was actually born in New Jersey, but hadn't been there for a long time. And so I got off the plane, got my rental car, and I could see the hotel from the rental car lot. And I could see the hotel and figured it'd be easy to drive from the rental car lot to the hotel. So I didn't pay too much attention to the map or the signs. I quickly found that I had taken a wrong turn and I attempted to get back. I saw a sign that said it was the way to New York, so I figured I didn't want to go that way. So I went the opposite way. And I quickly found myself on a thoroughfare or expressway in New Jersey. And I did not have a map of New Jersey, so I attempted to use the map that I had in my mind, which is based upon the way that freeways work in California. So I exited the freeway with the assumption that there would always be an on-ramp. Everywhere there was an off-ramp, there would be an on-ramp. So I exited the freeway, and in New Jersey, that's not true. So anybody who's from the East Coast knows there are some differences in the way that routes work. So I exited the freeway and I attempted to get back on and I proceeded to get more lost. And I eventually drove into the heart of Newark uh, and found my way back onto a freeway and thought I was going towards the airport and ended up about 20 miles in some grocery store in Newark where somebody kindly helped me to get back to the airport. What I learned is that we carry a map inside us of the world that's around us. And the map orients us and it directs us. So in Today's world, if I was traveling on a business trip, I would have a GPS system, which would probably direct me. It would give me instructions. It would tell me where to turn, and it would provide a visual cue. And unlike maps in the past, in the, in the map in the past, I would lo be located on the map, and I would see myself moving on the map. In today's GPS environment, we're the center of the map, and the map moves around us. Uh, so the way that we think about our place in the world is fundamentally changed now that we're in the digital age. And the final story is about madness. And madness is to leave the known map and venture beyond the edge of the map. If anybody remembers from Dante's Inferno, Ulysses was sent to one of the deepest levels of, uh, of the underworld for going beyond the edge of the known map. So his punishment for attempting to leave the map was to be relegated to the deepest level of the underworld. So we always exist within a known paradigm. So Edward Harrison is a cosmologist who wrote a book called The Masks of the Universe, which says that in every age, we live in a time where we all have an understanding of the universe that is our mask through which we see the universe, perceive the universe and understand it. And in every age, we view that as true or accurate, an accurate representation of the way that the universe is. And so the digital age for us represents a way of seeing the universe. So the universe uh, we see through the eyes of being in the digital age. So that's a paradigm which can, creates a guiding story. And what happens in a guiding story is it doesn't just present a map to us, but it also describes the methods of map making. What's a valid map? So for example, a method of map making, a cartographic map would tell me how to get to the airport, whereas a symbolic map might show me the purpose of the airport. So maps both describe the world and they, uh, they create the world. They're descriptive and prescriptive. So we live in an age now in which there's competing guiding stories about the nature of the world. We live in an analog world and we live in a digital world. So for example, right now, my voice is analog, it's recorded by my microphone on my computer, and it's presented back out over the speaker of your computer as analog. So we're often switching between analog and digital. Every time we switch between analog and digital, we now. gain organization, but we lose right. meaning. Okay, you're still on the phone. Uh, so in this translation between analog and digital, uh, we are continually making that transition. So on my MacBook Pro screen, I have a digital pixelated icon of an analog clock. And so we, when we press, drive a car, we're operating both in an analog and a digital world. When we brew coffee, 
We're operating in both an analog and a digital world. So there are competing maps and competing stories in the world that we live in. And we need to reconcile those two stories, those two views of the world in order to have a whole view of the world that we live in. So to close, I would say that there's an emerging paradigm that we don't yet know what it will be. And we only have the language, the grammar, and the ideas of the paradigm that we live in. So for example, the keyboard on my Mac Pro uses a paradigm of a QWERTY keyboard. And I learned to type on a manual typewriter, which was a royal typewriter. And when you press the key, how hard you press it determines the darkness of the type on the paper. But on my digital keyboard, it's one or zero. It's on or off. It's all or nothing. And so even though we're following the same metaphors, the meaning is different in a digital environment from an analog environment. And so I think we're working towards the synthesis of the analog and the digital that will lead us to a new kind of uh, paradigm or understanding, perhaps something connected to Priscilla's hyper-reality. Yeah, it's just so fascinating, Drew. You know, one thing that I, and I, I apologize because I was away for about two minutes of that, but I heard most of it. I don't know if you mentioned it in, in what you just said, but part of what I really loved about your article was where you also mentioned the god Hermes and you talk a lot about boundaries and where boundaries are on the internet or, or where they are not and Hermes as the god, the Greek god who is really the traverser of boundaries and um, there's one piece in here that I just found so interesting, I, if you don't mind I just want to read this and kind of leave this with people and then if, if it provokes questions later that would be fine but you talk about Hermes as the boundary crosser, the creator and disruptor of boundaries. And you note how his name is taken from the word Herm, which refers to a, a, stern, a stone marker or a border. That's where it originally came from. So you, you write, it is fitting that the God of markers is also the God of the unmarked. He is the God who erects boundaries, but, do, but does not abide by them. Akin to the Native American trickster figure of Coyote, he's the breaker of rules. He's the God of the road that leads home to the familiar, and he's the God of the road that leads to the unknown wilderness. He is the God of the point of origin, the destination, and the liminal space that lies in between. Not only is Hermes present in the digital age, he is present in the most intricate and vast set of gateways ever created. The internet itself is not simply a digital network, but rather a network of networks, each connected through a gateway that directs messages. So I, again, I mean, this just proves what a powerful metaphor the idea of the map is and, and how, you know, beginning to navigate this and locating ourselves within this is really a, a critical piece of it. So thank you, beautifully written article, really beautiful ideas, and uh, I highly recommend uh, everybody that you might even want to start with Drew's if you pick up the book. All right, thank you. Let's go on to Priscilla. Priscilla Hobbs, let me just share again your bio for everybody so that people have an understanding of this. And um, Priscilla's, Priscilla's article is, hold on, sorry. I, I got buried in my windows as I was looking for all those um, technical issues we were experiencing. Here we go. Um, so Priscilla Hobbs, her article is Virtual Hyperrealities, Redefining the Real World for the Hungry Imagination through digital media. So the hungry imagination, I love that term. I think it's really powerful. About Priscilla, so Priscilla Hobbs, PhD, earned her doctorate in mythological studies from Pacifica Graduate Institute. And she is the author of Walt's Utopia, Disneyland and American Mythmaking. Articles that she has published or presented at conferences concentrate popular culture as a modern living mythological system, including the Triwizard Cup, Alchemy and Transformation in Harry Potter, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, From Book to Embodied Myth, Rewriting Fairy Tales, Disney's Silly Symphonies and the Great Depression. Oh, that's one I haven't read, Priscilla. I'd like to read that. That sounds interesting. And Every Pony Has a Story, Revisions of Greco-Roman Mythology in My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. Dr. Hobbs is constantly looking critically at the relationship between popular culture and cultural identity, with current research focusing on theme parks, Disney studies, and American studies. So thank you so much, Priscilla. The floor is yours. Wow, thank you. Um, so the idea for this paper um, came actually out of my dissertation because in writing about theme parks, one of the uh, necessary roads that I ended up going down was Jean Baudrillard and Umberto Eco's theories on hyperreality. And the uh, definition of, that Jean Baudrillard uses for hyperreality is to describe an area that we treat as more real than real. 
So when he was writing, um, he used Disneyland as sort of the, the paragon of the hyper-realistic space. This is a theme space that is so completely inauthentic that we are completely convinced that it's real. So um, at Disneyland, you know, most of the trees that, um, you know, are right next to the queue lines, those are actually fake trees. And um, that they've constructed them that way on purpose for us to think that they're real trees. And so um, they do similar other tricks throughout the whole entire park to create a very controlled experience. Now Disneyland was built in 1955. So now, you know, 60 some odd years later, we've become so accustomed to the idea of theme space that when theme spaces are happening in the real world, uh, we may take them for granted. We may not even realize that we're being worked on in a very uh, controlled sort of way. So every time you go to a themed restaurant, for instance, you're being um, manipulated through hyperreality. So one of the things that I wanted to touch on with this article was this transition that seems to have been happening um, over the last, you know, 20, 30 years, depending on how you want to look at your timeline, of uh, moving from the idea of theme space as a um, real tangible place that we can touch and moving more into the idea of theme spaces in our virtual world and the extent to which those virtual worlds begin to control our expectations of the real world. And I think this has really taken off, um, especially in the last um, 10 or so years when we've moved from just having video games on consoles to having video games on our phones to having um, more increased uh, virtual spaces that we can go to, you know, like Bonnie, you were mentioning the, um, uh, the, the going onto the internet and trying to diagnose yourself. You know, there's more and more places where it's not just that you go onto WebMD and read, uh, you know, medical terminology, but you actually can interact in the virtual space with a virtual doctor who can diagnose you uh, virtually. Uh, we also have places like Second Life or uh, Minecraft where people are going into the virtual world and they are tapping into a community and they're finding more fulfillment in the community than they are finding in real life. So what does this ultimately mean for us as a society if we're moving everything into this virtual realm? Um, now, I'm a millennial. I admit it. There I go. I just said my age out on the internet. <laughs> but, um, so I, my entire life has been defined by having some sort of um, video game aspect in, uh, in my house. So I grew up with an Atari. I have no memory of never having an Atari. Um, I, you know, evolved from Atari to Nintendo. And I think I've touched almost every uh, generation of gaming console since. And one of the things that um, occurs to me as I, you know, as I was writing this, and one of my favorite lines, um, Bonnie, I think you even highlighted it in the editorial process, was that our, cons our consoles become a way to console us, that we turn to the video game space because there's something comforting and reassuring about being in the virtual realm where we have more control over what's happening than we may have in our real world. And interestingly, we have control, but at the exact same time, we're on a manipulated storyline. So someone has already dictated the story and we're just controlling our avatar through the story and having this particular experience in this virtual space. And we've moved this um, from like Mar Super Mario Brothers and The Legend of Zelda into things like Farmville or um, you know places where you can spend Bitcoins and you can have like this, you know, spend real life money on a you know the clothing for your avatar and you know build yourself this little you know kim kardashian like dream house in your virtual space using real money and uh you know we like to live in there as if it's someplace else there's this interesting phenomenon of people who meet on like world of warcraft or second life and then they end up um you know getting into a relationship and getting married and then as soon as they meet in the real world their relationship falls apart. Like the only place it was solid was in the virtual realm. So many of these people just keep their relationship virtual and never have the physical interaction because the emotional satisfaction that comes from the virtual relationship is that much more potent than the relationships than they could form in the real world. So it takes it to a very interesting place where, you know, um, as psychologists, we've talked for decades about the importance of the physical connection with people not just the emotional connection that you know the nature versus nurture you need to actually have contact and um, 
we're creating this whole generation of people who are far more comfortable not having the physical contact as long as they can have the very strong emotional uh, relationship with the people that they find most meaningful. So we end up developing these relationships in the virtual space with you know, people we may never have met and there are people miles and miles away and it creates this interconnectivity of the world that I don't think even Jung could have ever anticipated. Um, you know, it's, it, it takes globalism to this whole new realm. It's not just, uh, you know, consuming the space, but it's, it's connecting us in this very deep, you know, relevant sort of way. And, um, you know, I, when I think of the hungry imagination, I think that it comes from um, sort of this weird uh, relationship that we've created for ourselves between, um, you know, consumerism, but also uh, our interactions with other people. And so, um, you know, American culture in particular, because all my roads lead back to America, um, we've created a society where uh, we define ourselves based on our abilities to consume. So if you're considered a uh, successful American, air quote, successful American, it means that you have uh, a certain threshold of consumability. You can have a car, you can have a home, you can have the two and a half kids, the dog, the big screen TV, and you can do all of this theoretically without debt. The reality, though, is that um, to achieve that concept of um, the American dream for, especially for the millennial generation, is actually nigh impossible unless there is a lot of debt involved. And so, um, you know, the millennials in particular, I find, are uh, reaching beyond what they can have in the physical realm and going into the virtual space simply because it gives them that opportunity to have that meaningful connection without necessarily being tethered to the consumerism, but we're also talking about a generation of people who know how to do nothing else but consume. <laughs> so um, it, it, it's this really very interesting, um, almost conflict of interest that's happening. And it's, it's definitely a paradigm shift. And it's something that we're going to want to watch uh, definitely far more closely. When I first wrote this article, it was back in 2012. So uh, we were definitely facing a completely different America than we're facing today. And so, um, you know, things, everything that, you know, we wrote about in this book may completely be overturned next year. And the, the significance of that virtual space may, may become that much more important. You know, we may see um, more people reaching out to the virtual space, like even just within the last month, the amount of groups who are using the virtual space as um, political activism and they're making like best friends on the virtual space, especially on Facebook. Um, because it's the only place where they feel welcomed and they can gain the reassurance that they are in fact, um, you know, significant and authentic. And so, um, you know, I think it would be actually very interesting to revisit this conversation um, after January, <laughs> but um, definitely for sure, um, we also are going to possibly, there's, there's already conversations happening that might put the virtual space at risk. And so, um, you know, we've developed this world, as Bonnie said, the internet's not going anywhere, but is it going to necessarily be the accessible tool that it is now? And so as long as, um, you know, there's enough of a fan base who's willing to keep it moving forward in a positive, constructive direction, we can we'll still have this utility available to us, but it's quite possible that, um, you know, we've also created an entire, uh, generation of gamers who are so used to having the narrative fed to them that they may not be able to fully recognize the shift that happens in the internet before it actually happens. And of course, I've completely digressed entirely away from the article, but, <laughs> you know, Bonnie did say informal and I started rambling. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, and, you know, I do want to also say, um, if, if Bonnie, if that's okay with you, that I want to give a shout out to um, Jordan Shapiro. He was uh, one of the original um, brain children behind uh, this book. And um, he had to bow out, you know, as everyone frequently does when they start write, doing a lot of projects and dissertations that certain other projects have to go by the sidelines. But I do want to give him a public shout out for, um, you know, have being part of the initiation of this project and, um, you know, helping to uh, give us the call to adventure that led us to this, this final book. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, Jordan was the brainchild behind the whole thing and launched the, the call for proposals and, and uh, we even was with us for a good portion of the, the first initial submission. So yeah, we miss him. <laughs> and I think that this book would be a great tribute to him. Thank you, Priscilla. You know, it's just so fascinating what you're saying about the whole millennial and the next generation. And I, I wrote down what you said about um, that this is a generation that knows how to do nothing more, uh, who doesn't know how to do anything but consume. I, I'm not sure that was a, your, your exact words, but that strikes fear in my heart. And yet it's something that I've done a lot of writing myself about, not in those terms exactly, not really, but I, I guess I haven't thought about it from a generational standpoint. And, and it just, it, it's quite, terrifying on many levels for me and and yet it kind of validates on so many levels I think something that I'm feeling very strongly and that is the the need to raise awareness and raise consciousness around what's happening and around how we are in our culture because as long as we're like fish in water we, we can't see what's happening we aren't aware of it then we certainly can't begin to do anything about it and so so, you know, the whole approach, the depth psychological approach is really important to me, as most of you know, and, uh, and I know it's important to most of you because of the articles that have come out of this, the, the each one has, have really tapped into something so prescient, I think, that, that prescient that is really um, important for us as we begin to look forward. And you're right, it's very dynamic. It's changing, like from moment to moment. So in January, <laughs> we visit this, yeah, um, 2018, 2020, I mean, it's, it's going to continue to be that way. And uh, there's, there is one paragraph in your article that you wrote that I think is relevant to this. And it just talks about how um, it says the children of the 1980s were replaced by the children of the 1990s, many of whom know of no life without the internet. For them, the internet provides all of the answers, and it is the only way to communicate with friends and family. The prevalence of the internet ensures that our world will become increasingly like a video game. The lines between the hyperreal and the real will become increasingly blurred. And we've already seen how the internet can build a new sense of community and personal relationships. So perhaps the video game heroes of the future will be tasked with saving us from the overabundance of hyper reality. So we'll see if those heroes emerge and, uh, and if they are <laughs> psychological heroes. <laughs> some some right. of the old gods emerging, I think. Thank you. Really Thank brilliant, you. brilliant article. And uh, I think it did diverge a bit, so I hope everybody will go back and read the article itself. <laughs> provide some wonderful insights. So thank you so much. All right, last but not least, let's move on. So our third panelist is Robert Ramanishan. So a lot of you will be familiar with Robert's work. You know, his book, uh, which is on my shelf, and it's almost like a Bible to me, uh, is, uh, I guess I should have had it out here so I could talk about it. But Robert, Robert your work with technology, even starting as, as recently as 20 or 30 years ago, has been really really critically acclaimed and also I think provides a profound context for us. Um, so maybe we can talk more about that book in a minute, but I want to give you a chance to actually address the, the article that you wrote. So Robert's article in this book is called Terminal Talk, Reflections on Thinking and Saying in the Digital World. And I think that Robert will share some uh, pretty personal experiences about his first, his, his encounters with the, with not only the internet, but technology in general. So let me read Robert's bio for everyone. Robert Ramanishan is an emeritus professor at Pacifica Graduate Institute, author of seven books, including his most recent, Leaning Toward the Poet, eavesdropping on the poetry of everyday life. Robert has published numerous book chapters along with more than, more than 40 articles in psychology, philosophy, and education journals. Robert has done numerous radio, television, and online interviews and has given keynote addresses at conferences around the world. And um, uh, of course, uh, <laughs> I, I've had many uh, online experiences now with Robert in various groups and courses and classes and things. And so I'm really um, just so amazed at how you have managed the technology and uh, always showing up. And I'm really glad that you were able to come back <laughs> in this scenario and uh, you know it's true technology is very tricky it, it has that hermetic quality to it that we mentioned with along with Drew's our, um, presentation and article and uh, and and it constantly shows up, up and keeps us on our toes but I also want to just say Robert that you've inspired me so much in my own quest for understanding and being able to use technology and so um, with that let's turn the time over to Robert Robert I'm gonna unmute you hang on one second you got it. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Well, my first res response is, wow. <laughs> one of the nice things about going last, or one of the difficult things about going last, is that it throws you off 
what you're going to say because um, I just want to comment and reflect and change what I was going to say in light of what you has said and Priscilla has said, both of them, very powerful articles. So I'm trying to weave my way so that I do justice to what the, the uh, purpose is tonight, but at the same time, try to speak a little bit to my article in the context of what Drew and Priscilla said. I'm going to begin with a provocative statement. Um, Priscilla, this is, this is towards you, because you're the only one who confessed to being a millennial. I certainly am so pre-millennial that uh, it's not funny. <laughs> And I want to link what I'm going to say to what Bonnie said about uh, realizing, as you realized, the generational viewpoint, the generational differences between the children of the 80s and the 90s. My provocative statement is to Priscilla as a representative, what you said as a millennial who grew up with computers, do you think you belong to a different species than I do? I think it's not just a generational viewpoint or conflict that we're facing. We're facing a species conflict. And I think that um, in the book I'm working on, The Frankenstein Prophecy, and I'll get to that in light of what the article I wrote, but it began with the moon landing because those who grew up post-1969 grew up with a changed understanding of the moon. And when you change your understanding of the heavens, you change your understanding of the earth. And when you change your understanding of the earth, you change your understanding of what it means to be an embodied human being in connection with nature through the body. So having said that, um, I want to raise then the question that maybe what we have to do, and again, this goes back to, I think, what everybody said, is how do deaf psychologists respond not only to um, a new kind of world that let's call it the digital world, the digital age, but how does deaf psychology respond to this new kind of world in such a way that we don't forget uh, what we are leaving behind? Um, because if we are going to move forward, and I think it goes back to what Priscilla said, move forward positively, uh, you, cannot, you cannot know where you're going unless you know where you've come from so that you know where you are now. So the tack I'm going to take is more uh, uh, historical. And I come out of two traditions, phenomenology and depth psychology. And so what that means for me is that I look and have looked at questions of technology always from the point of view of a clinician, a psychotherapist, a deaf psychologist. And what that means is two things. Whatever I look at from a technological point of view, whether it was the first book about the origins of technology or whether it's writing about my webinar experience or other articles that I've written in between these two uh, or prior to them, the way I look at them is as symptoms. And what do I mean by symptoms? I mean, a symptom, whether we're talking individually or collectively, is a tension between forgetting something that is too painful to remember, but having to remember it because it's too vital to forget. So I'm always moving between not losing memory for the sake of imagining what the future might be. And then also I look at technology as a dream. And in all the experience and the years that I've had in seeing patients and being in analysis, whether you're a Freudian or a Jungian, every dream is a nightly humiliation of the ego conscious mind. No matter how you interpret it, every dream has a piece of Socratic irony in it. It's always bringing out what is hidden and what we take for granted. So that's what I'm looking at when I think about technology. I don't like using so much technical terms like shadow or even unconscious. I'd rather use terms like, what have we left by the side of the road? What is it that uh, still lingers in the present even as an absence? And that's the way I'm approaching technology. So to give a concrete example, first an example that goes back 
to what I said earlier about the moon landing. Shortly after the moon landing in 1969, um, I was in South Africa, and I was in one of the homelands of the Koza people. It was a really uh, privileged position, invitation, and I was out there one night in the trance sky where their, their village is. It was a celebration that I was invited to. There were no lights there, and the full moon was there. And you don't really realize why we use the word lunacy when we're speaking about madness until you've been in the landscape where the moonbeams penetrate your skull. No light, nothing there. It's a primitive, natural wilderness. And so the next day, when I was invited to the ceremony and I was asked to give a talk, I stood up and I thanked the chief and I asked the people what they thought about the American experience of landing on the moon. And these are not ignorant people. These are not dumb people. They knew that happened, but they laughed. They said it was a trick. And I asked them, what do you mean? They said, well, the moon hangs in the sky vertically. If you tried to walk on it, it would be like trying to walk on a wall. You'd fall off. Now, that doesn't come out of ignorance. That comes out of the fact that they live in a different world than I do. And that's where I think we are today. I think we're at a threshold that's increasingly becoming almost like an impassable boundary, not easy to cross. Drew, your remarks on Hermes, I think, are very important, and I'd like to get back to that. But the threshold that we're leaving, uh, living at now, I was reminded of it, and that's what led to my article. When I did the first webinar, how long ago was that, Bonnie? Maybe 18 months ago, maybe two years, with Brian Tracy on, on poetry. Am I still there? Yes. Yeah, because um, the image of the bee in the hive has come up, and I don't see anybody anymore. Oh, I hit my mute instead. Yeah. Oh, all right, OK. So I. I was doing this webinar and I mentioned this in passing, how difficult it was for me to be in digital space. And that's what I write about in the article, uh, particularly about seeing myself over there, but being over here. And it's not the same thing as a television experience. It's almost uh, a kind of visionary dream quality to it. But where is the I who is speaking? That was one thing. But the one thing when I started to reflect on the webinar experience was one that I had maybe two months prior to that with my grandson, who was about two years old. And I'm not a Luddite. I think we have to try as depth psychologists to find a path between not forgetting where we've come from, a sense of history, so we can imagine a future uh, and know where we are now, between that and saying bad technology, let's just smash the machines. That's just stupid. You can't disinvent technology. So we have to find a way to really understand it and live with it. So with my grandson, I love Skype. He lives in Austin, Texas. We can cross that boundary of space and time. I can see him. I can uh, hear his lovely voice. And one day, we had Skyped enough that he was somewhat familiar with it. He was eating a piece of toast or something. And he said, Grandpa, do you want a taste? And I said, yes. And he came to the screen and he put it to the screen. And then he pulled back. And he's not a philosopher, he was only two. But you could see a puzzlement entered into his face because there were no bite marks on the you know? And he looked at it and I read his puzzlement and that started the further reflection of what it means to live in digital space. Of the many things that I, I speak about in the article, I'm only gonna highlight this to give you a taste of this, is we are out of touch even while we have the illusion of being in touch while we're in the digital world. There is no haptic sense, no sense of touch in the digital world. I can see all of you, I can hear all of you, but I can't smell any of you. You have no sense, there is no, no interconnectedness on the sensuous, sensual level between us. No sense of being together as a community of embodied beings. 
So being in touch with the illusion of being in touch everywhere and anywhere, but really out of touch and not being able then to, to, uh, to be in touch in that way, other things follow. It means we are, I think, in the way that I've tried to write now, the Frankenstein prophecy, which, by the way, Drew, based on your article, Frankenstein book by Mary Shelley is the myth of the madness of our scientific revolution. That's the myth that underlies it. The, and it's Hermes who permeates, Hermes' footprint in the Frankenstein book, I say that. So I was not uh, glad to find your reference to Hermes. His footprint is all over the internet. But God, the, uh, Hermes as a God or a messenger linked the world of the gods and the world of the humans. And ever since the rise of modern science in the 15th century, now I go back to the technology, but there are no gods. The vertical world has collapsed into an infinite expanse of the horizontal world. And where there are no gods anymore, then the capacity that we have uh, under the sway of Hermes in the digital world leads to a kind of psychological inflation. And that's one of the dangers that we can believe that we can be everywhere and anywhere almost instantaneously. That is a fantasy from time immemorial. So I am not saying at all that I would rather live in a world where there is no technology. I celebrate Bonnie for being one of those heroes that Drew and Priscilla are talking about, or heroines to be, to be accurate here. But at the same time, I don't want us to forget what we are leaving behind because we are becoming another species. In the Frankenstein book, I talk about Homo astronauticus as a leap in evolution beyond Homo sapiens. But we're, we're way beyond that now. We're Homo digitalis. And in the Frankenstein book, if you play with the word digitalis, it's a foxglove flower and it's used to keep the rhythm of the heart in pace when it has gotten out of sync with its environment. So as we peck away at the computer, you know, we, we are keeping, trying to keep time in a world where we're on call 24 seven. Is that a danger? Well, I don't even want to speak about that. I'd rather speak of it being a crisis in the old Chinese sense of that term. Where there is a crisis, there is a danger and an opportunity. So I'm going to end with that so we have time to talk with each other. But I really celebrate, Bonnie, Drew, I loved your article. Priscilla, I loved your article. I have to say I have a better sense of what you mean by hyper-reality by listening to your wonderful summary of your paper. And I hope that people who are not old dogs like me keep speaking like you do, Priscilla, like Bonnie does. Drew, I don't know how old you are, but you certainly look younger than me. Keep doing the work that you're doing. But let's not forget where we have come from so we know where we're going. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. It's just, you know, your work has been so powerful for me, as I mentioned, for many years. And, and so much of it is because you are completely focused on the poetic aspect of things, the poetic sensibility of things. And while you're open to all the possibilities of the technology, you are the one who is true to that, you know, coming back to yourself. So that whole idea of not knowing where we've come from, and, and therefore, if we don't know where we've come from, we can't possibly know where we're going. It's like you have transcended that. You're the one who kind of has your foot in both those worlds. And I really see your work as a bridge in all of this, as, as are many of the authors and contributors in this book actually um, and I, I think that most of these articles have been have made it very accessible yeah. and so that's one thing that I really appreciate about your work and so yeah there's so much to talk about and um, so much to do I, I wanted to leave a few minutes for the audience to ask questions if you have some and also to make comments we don't have a lot of time but we do have a few minutes and so I welcome you to do that. If you'd like to type the questions into the chat, you can do that. And so of course, you know, you can move your mouse on the screen and um, pick the chat 
button that you see there and just type those in and everybody will see those or at least I will see those and I can read them aloud. If you'd like to actually speak up and um, say something or and or say something and turn on your camera, you're more than welcome to do that. I just need to unmute you and then you can turn on your own camera. You will not be on camera unless you choose to be on your end. So if you'd like to do that, you can raise your hand. And you, in order to raise your hand, again, you just move your mouse on the screen and you should see either below or above, depending on which device you're using, uh, an electronic hand that allows you to actually raise your hand. So we do have a hand already. So Sperry, I'm going to unmute you. And okay, we have a, we have a couple of hands up here. So Okay, so let's see. I have several people here. Sperry, I am unmuting you, so you can go ahead and make your comment. <clears throat> yeah. Um... I wanted to make a comment about uh, the speaker that was just uh, talking about how we are out of touch. We can't smell each other. And um, I've been exploring for over 30 years internationally with thousands of people, how by noticing what we notice together, even uh, in the last eight or so years through teleconferencing, exploring this and also on audio only, um, if we, if we notice what we notice together and we use our words to point to what it is that we're sharing or noticing together, uh, we can actually begin to taste what each other tastes. We can feel what each other feels. We, we go into samadhi. We can actually see each other's thoughts. Um, I model consciousness in physics with other physicists, and it's very clear that at one level uh, we're not separate at all. Uh, yes, if we give our attention to what we think and uh, who we think we are, what we think we're doing, and uh, and activities which are in the you know, in the world of appearances uh, uh, alone, we uh, we can feel isolated from everyone and everything. But if we are aware of awareness, which the yogis have suggested for thousands of years, uh, we find that awareness is really not mine or yours. There's only one of it. And we're all meeting there. All of our individual perceptual faculties are, are being received and reflected in this, this, um, in this mirror-like awakeness. Uh, and it's the same awakeness in all of us and has been throughout our whole lives. That's un an unchanging context that if we become conscious of it uh, individually or indivisibly together, we can uh, be completely intimate and enter into uh, a commonly sensed intelligence and access our combined intelligence uh, uh, even better than we are this moment. We can, it's like turning up the potentiometer on the light switch. Uh, the light of our consciousness can be intensified to the point that we are revealed uh, to each other. Uh, so that's what I wanted to add. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true, Sperry. I mean, I agree with you on so many levels. We, you know, technology does connect us and we are interconnected as I think both, uh, well, probably all three of the panelists said today in ways that we can't begin to even imagine or couldn't, especially a few years ago or a few decades ago. Um, but it's, it's actually even beyond the technology piece of it because in some ways this puts us in a different kind of sync. It comes back to that different species that Robert was talking about, I think. Would anybody else on the panel like to, to speak to what Sperry just said or to something that sparked for you on that? And you'll have to unmute yourselves. Robert, you're, un you're muted. Priscilla, you're unmuted. Did you want to say something? Um, you know, one of the things, oh, go ahead. Um. I think that's a, an interesting and fascinating comment, and obviously you've done a lot of research on that. And I don't, I don't take issue with that. I would simply say that it's a kind of consciousness that you're speaking about, on one hand, that very few people can achieve. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it's a kind of consciousness that seems to me to be still a little bit ungrounded in the flesh and the sensuous, sensual relationship between the flesh of our embodiment, which has defined our species since we first stood up in East Africa, and the sensuous display of the world. And I, I think I have a sense of that in my almost 40 years of experience with patients. 
that when something is really working in psychotherapy, you are in a space together that is not defined either by your consciousness or the patient's consciousness, but something very close to what you're speaking about. And most of the work that takes place in psychotherapy is below the intentional, thoughtful words that people speak. Yeah. It's in the gestural field, which they co-create together. So that would be the place where I would try to continue my conversation with you. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, great. Okay. I would love to respond if that's all right. Well, in the interest of time, let me just see if anybody else has a comment or question. Sure. We are running right up to our hour here, and it's always a question of whether we should extend longer or, or take these kinds of things into the world and continue these conversations online. Does anybody else have a question uh, you'd like to raise your hand? Actually, somehow, Lori, I ended up moving you into a space where I can unmute you, and I don't know if that was because you had your hand up or if if I did that by accident. So I am unmuting you. If you'd like to say something, you can say something now. So Lori. Okay, that might have been an accident. <laughs> All right, great. Okay, anybody else have a, a question or a comment? Um, Robert, would you, would you like to say more about that or um, uh, one of the other panelists? Priscilla, you were going to? No, I don't want to say any more. I think, yeah, okay. maybe one of the other panelists want to speak to that. Priscilla, go ahead. Or another topic, if you choose. Well, the, um, I did want to respond to uh, Robert's question about us being a different species, because I think that that is a uh, very important question that's sort of underlying where our discussion is going right now, is the extent to which um, you know, the, the use of technology and the adaptation of technology is, uh, what impact is it actually having on the very function of our humanity? And you know, one of the things that's defined, defined humanity for so long is our use of technology. You know, we, um, you know, archeologists are quick to point out that, you know, we evolved, you know, uh, because we adapted to technology, we developed tools, we, um, you know, adapted to an environment that relied entirely on um, you know technology and so now that we're using these new kind of tools are we in fact evolving into a different species and one of the things that i always look to when we start getting into the uncomfortable conversation about the future of humanity is i look at what myths are we making right now what are the american myths that we we see and i always that's when i always looked into popular culture and that's one of the reasons why most of my work is centralized in popular culture and you know, I think that there's a lot of fear around where we're going. And I think that's um, sort of the same kind of fear that was expressed by Mary Shelley and her Frankenstein was, you know, what could actually happen if we let technology run amok? But at the same token, I think humanity as a whole is very good at self-regulating. And so I'm thinking of like, um, you know, I'm, I'm raving. If any of you are friends with me on Facebook, you've probably seen my posts ad nauseum about Moana and the recent Disney film. and um, one of the things underlying messages of Moana is about um, it's really about the journey and it's about uh, connecting to the technology that makes the journey possible and it's not so much about where we're going but it's about the getting there and I think that's where we're at now you know we are in the middle of this huge technological revolution that's going to go one way or another but the possibilities are quite open right now and we're having a journey and we're sharing this journey collectively with more people than he, the earth has ever sustained in her entire life. And so it's, it's going to be, it's a very beautiful journey. I think for us to all share on that, to be part of this collective moment in time, sort of in a way, it's like that moment of the lunar landing. It was a one moment in time that so many people were tapped into, but now we've expanded it. We've made this huge global mechanism through the internet. We're all part of this, uh, this global moment that's going to take us somewhere, but we don't know where. And that's the beauty of the journey. That's yeah. the beauty of not having a map <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> to tie back to Drew. Or, or making the map up as we go on some level. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Being a, in co-creation with that map. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're coming to the end here, and I want to let people go who uh, have other commitments and things that they need to do. Drew, did you want to say any last words before we bring this to a close? I got to unmute myself before I can say any words. You do. Uh, so, so I think we are all embodied. We enter into a space, and one of the things that I, 
I used to work as a night computer operator, so it was just me sitting there with the machines. Mm. And I write about that as the magic hour, which is a, qu a qualitative experience of time, not quantitative. So we enter into a qualitative experience of time, uh, uh, and, and time is um, chirotic time, not chrono, time is chronos. And so when you say the hour is up, the magic hour that I always experienced is not an hour in terms of uh, clock time, but it's an hour of experience. And so later when I uh, spent that time between, I say the magic hours between midnight and two, now I experience it as being connected to people all over the world. I used to think I was alone sitting in front of this computer as the only computer operator, it was just me and the machines. But now I have this experience of being connected to all these people. And it's an experience of entering into this space. But then when you leave this space, all of a sudden you become reaware and reawakened to the physical environment that you're in. And so sometimes that magic hour goes until the sun comes up, like when you're working on your dissertation. <laughs> and then only when you un disconnect from that, you become reconnected to the physical space that you're in, the smells, the scents. And the, so I think... It's an interesting experience of entering into that space, the shared space that we've created, all the interesting ideas, and then of, 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 of going back into the physical world, whether you're in Hawaii or New Hampshire or, or wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I, um, I, I've had similar experiences of, of watching when Twitter. When I first got into Twitter a few years ago, I would sit all night. I'm kind of a night owl, and I would sit all night and just watch that Twitter stream go by. And a lot of people have commented on how that's like the collective unconscious. It's kind of seeing what's erupting out of out of that you know mass and what's important to us. And um, if, to me, it always felt very shamanic. It was almost like stepping into this river and being in this alternate reality where you could get all kinds of really fascinating information and perspectives and insights and then um, coming back out of that at the end of the night or the end of the day, whatever that was, and, and being able to apply that or use it in some way was always really fascinating and interesting. So I just want to thank everybody who spent the time here today. I wanted to just finish by reading a couple of the um, comments that were made in the chat. And thank you so much to everybody that was participating there. Priscilla was uh, multitasking, participating at, in both the written and the uh, ad, as she was talking. And I just love that. I really admire people that can do that. That's, I don't know if that's a sign of a millennial or somebody that's just really gifted at that, but um, that's great. I wanted to thank also Susie and Holly and um, Lori, you, you asked some questions. And one question that did come up, Robert, was for you just briefly, and that was uh, if you actually came up with the term homo digitalis. So That's not the end of the story, because we're going even beyond that if you read Ray Kurzweil. Um, and, and that's... That's something I think we all, he's, he's a serious thinker. We have to come to terms with him. Might not agree with him, but you have to come to terms with him. Yeah. Yeah. And I think probably everybody who's watching this will know who he is. And may, I thought we would get a little more into some of his ideas, but we didn't. Maybe on Saturday, just a reminder, there is another one of these panels with different authors on Saturday. I wish you guys could all come back. We need more time with you. But again, thank you, everybody who participated. I will pass on some of your comments in maybe a forum or a blog. If you'd like to continue this conversation in the written forum on Depth Psychology Alliance, please do so. You can find the forum there. If you go on and look under the dialogue tab, there's a forum uh, tab and you can, you can start there or you can go to the Facebook Depth Psychology Alliance page and continue the conversation there. So please, you know, do that. Give us feedback. Let's have this kind of interconnectivity that we have so much access to in, in the community. And really, uh, you know, just continue to appreciate one another in this opportunity that we have to share not only knowledge with each other, but the, the real genuine arrows, the real genuine connectivity that we, that we have. So thank you, everybody. And hopefully see many of you on Saturday. Thanks to all the panelists. Thank you.